Episode 90 Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw, toad that under cold stone, days and nights has thirty-one, sweated venom sleeping got, boil thy first, I the charmed pot, double double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. Fillet of a finny snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. For a charm of powerful trouble, let the hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double toil and trouble, fire burn, and cauldron bubble. Greetings and welcome in to the Patuxet General. It's Halloween! It's my favorite time of year, and we've got a whole bucket full of folklore, frivolity, food, and frightening tales. This week, we bring you the folklore story of Jack of the Lantern, luscious ginger miso carrot soup, you could tell the future with an Irish brambrack cake, and sip a glass of our easy enchanted punch while you listen to the finale of The Fall of the House of Usher. I've got your Samhain celebrations on lock. But first, I must thank our Patreon subscribers. These decked-out folk are the skeletons, mummies, vampires, witches, chocolates, Swedish fish, flashlights, gummies, masks, costumes, jack-of-the-lanterns, bobbed apples, darkened streets, hay bales, and tricks that are the Halloween fun that is the Patuxet General, without whom we would merely be spooky. If you would like to become one of these Listening to Haunted Tales folks, simply follow the link in the show notes, or look for our page on patreon.com. But until then, thank you. And let's talk about that pumpkin you just carved. This is the story of Jack O'Lantern. However, here at the start, we call him Stingy Jack. More years ago than I have breath to count, a tight-fisted man by the name of Jack made a deal with the devil. When years had passed, and Jack had long enough enjoyed his part of the deal, it came to pay the devil his due. But when old Nick came to get him, Jack convinced him to get a drink with him first, knowing of the devil's love of liquor. The two sat down, and one became many. They enjoyed themselves until late into the night, and when the bill comes due, stingy Jack reveals he has no money to pay, but an idea of how to do so. Jack convinces the devil to turn into a coin to pay the bill, and then turn back after it's been paid. The drunken and perhaps foolish devil agrees. However, stingy Jack betrays him by slipping the coin into his pocket, where he also has a rosary, which keeps the devil from returning to his original form. Jack sneaks away from the bar, and the devil calls out to be set free. Stingy Jack replies that he will only set him free if he agrees never to let Jack be burned by the fires of hell. Jack counts himself lucky as the devil agrees, and he sets him free and goes on his merry way. Years pass, and since Stingy Jack feels that he has nothing to fear from the devil in hell, his behavior towards his fellow man does not improve. Eventually, death comes for us all, and that was also true for Jack. When he passed, he went up to heaven, but St. Peter would not let him into the golden warmth of heaven. Cold and desperate, he went to the gates of hell to implore the devil to let him in, to save him from the cold. But the demon reminded him of their deal and forbade him entrance. Eventually, even the devil had pity for him and gave him one of hell's eternal coals, Jack carved out a turnip with which to carry the coal and made holes in it to use as a light to guide his way. Some say in bitterness he led travelers through the muddy moors to their doom. Others say it was just easier to see him when the veil is thin. This Halloween night, keep an eye out for Jack of the Lantern or make your own turnip lantern 
like the one from the early 1900s at the National Museum of Ireland Country Life in County Mayo. They call it the Ghost Turnip. Our first recipe is the answer to a question sent in to me about a fabulous item in the Patuxet Village Farmer's Market. Our dear friends at Leah's Vegetables have been selling fresh ginger, stems, leaves, and all. The stems are about three feet long and the leaves are thin, long, and very fragrant. We at the General have used the leaves and stems as a bed for chicken thighs and they were lovely. This soup is an excellent stick-to-your-ribs, colorful, and delicious example of a use for fresh ginger. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. For this recipe, you will need one tablespoon olive oil, one onion peeled and diced, two garlic cloves peeled and diced, two tablespoons peeled and grated ginger root, two teaspoons red miso paste, four cups diced carrots, one half cup yellow split peas, rinsed and drained, and five cups of low salt, vegetable or chicken stock. This soup seamlessly blends the natural sweetness of carrots and zesty ginger with the added umami of a rich creamy miso. The bulk of this soup is provided by the humble carrot and yellow split peas, both of which you may already have in your fridge or pantry, making this soup a convenient, budget-friendly, and simple to prepare dish. In a large saucepan over medium heat, add the olive oil and the onions. Cook for five minutes and then add the garlic, ginger root, and miso paste. Stir for about 30 seconds and then add the carrots, split peas, and stock. Bring it to a boil and cook until the carrots are soft, approximately 30 minutes. This recipe then calls for your soup to be blended with either an immersion blender or in your actual blender, but I prefer it chunky. I think you will too. Enjoy! Barmbrack, our second recipe, is an important part of the Irish Samhain celebration. It is believed that Samhain is the time of the year when the veil between life and death is thinnest. This makes it the best time to divine information from the other side. There are many ways to do so, with apple peels, yes, no stones, with water, seeds, scrying, coins, mirrors, and yes, even cards. But this cake topped all these methods. Your year was made or lost, depending on what the hostess served you in your slice. And yes, there is some suggestion that she may have chosen for you at times, if she were that kind of person. If you got the ring, you were to marry within the year. The stick and your marriage would go poorly, or the pea and not marry at all. If you were lucky enough to get the coin, you knew that money would follow. But woe if you got the cloth, for you would look forward to becoming destitute. It was a big chance to take on a piece of spiced fruitcake. For extra magic potency, apple could be grated in. But for me, this is a potent enough cake. I can't wait to see what I get this year. Let me know how you do. Email me your results, jess at patuxetgeneral.com, and leave some champ out for the fairies, and have a happy Samhain. For this recipe, you will need two-thirds of a cup plain flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, one and a half cups, packet of fruit mixed, raisin sun sultanas work best, one cup cold tea, one quarter cup whiskey, one half cup light brown sugar, one large egg, one half teaspoon mixed spice, pumpkin spice or apple pie spice would mix well, and a ring to place inside. Place the fruit mix in a bowl and pour over the whiskey and cold tea. Allow this to soak up the liquid overnight. In the morning, preheat the oven to 340 degrees and grease and line a loaf pan. Combine the flour, baking powder, sugar, and mixed spice in a mixing bowl. Make a well and break in the egg. Using a wooden spoon, mix the egg with the dry ingredients. Add a little bit of the liquid the fruit mix is sitting in and mix it through. You may not need all the liquid. You are looking for a wet dough. Then stir through the fruit mix until everything is fully combined. Add in the ring and any other piece of traditional symbols of a pea, 
a piece of cloth, a matchstick, and a coin, and stir through. Spoon the wet dough into a lined loaf tin, and place in the oven in the middle shelf, and bake for one hour. Remove from the pan and allow to cool slightly before removing from the loaf tin and placing on a wire rack. Then cover and cling wrap in tin foil and allow to sit from one to two days before cutting into it. Serve in slices, spread with a little butter, and a nice cup of tea. This traditional Irish Brombach recipe is from the Irish Times. Enjoy. This just in, the most exciting time of the year is upon us at the Edgewood Congregational Church, the annual Holiday Bazaar, November 18th, 2023, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. This year is bigger than ever. Lydia's Closet, the thrift store, has been collecting all sorts of really useful items, stunning jewelry, clothing, and that's just them. We are filled to the brim with vendors, food vendors you may recognize from the farmer's market. The Patuxent General itself will be chock full of pies to sell. The Bazaar will have games for the kids and pinball from Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration. Come join us November 18th, 2023 from 9 a.m. till 2 p.m. I'll meet you there. I want to tell you about my friend Mike and his Electromagnetic Pinball Museum and Restoration Arcade. It's an all-inclusive place to relax and share anything related to modern pinball, EM pinball, and arcade games. A group of pinball and arcade fans with an addiction to games of all kinds and Lego too. $10 gets you free play on pinball and arcade games all day. You can find them at 881 Main Street, Pawtucket, Rhode Island, or online at www.electromagneticpinballmuseum.com. And now the continuing reading of The Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe, Part 2. Roderick Usher, whom I had known as a boy, was now ill and had asked me to come and help him. When I arrived, I had felt something strange and fearful about the great old stone house, and about the lake in front of it, and about Usher himself. He appeared not like a human being, but like a spirit that had come back from beyond the grave. It was an illness, he said, from which he would surely die." called his sickness fear. I have, he said, no fear of pain, but only the fear of its result, of terror. I feel that the time will soon arrive when I must lose my life and my mind and my soul together in some last battle with that horrible enemy, fear. I learned also, but slowly, and through broken words and doubtful meaning, another strange fact about the condition of Usher's mind. He had certain sick fears about the house in which he lived, and he had not stepped out of it for many years. He felt that the house, with its gray walls and quiet lake around it, had somehow, through the long years, gotten a strong hold on his spirit. He said, however, that much of the gloom which lay so heavily on him was probably caused by something more plainly to be seen. By the long-continued illness, indeed the coming death, of a dearly loved sister, his only company for many years. Except for himself, she was the last member of his family on earth. When she dies, he said with a sadness which I can never forget. When she dies, I will be the last of the old, old family, the House of Usher. While he spoke, the Lady Madeline, for so she was called, passed slowly through a distant part of the room, and without seeing that I was there, went on. I looked at her with a complete and wondering surprise, and with some fear, and yet I found I could not explain to myself such feelings. My eyes followed her. When she came to a door and it closed behind her, my eyes turned to the face of her brother. But he had put his face in his hands, and I could only see that the thin fingers through which his tears were flowing were whiter than ever before. The illness of the Lady Madeline had long been beyond the help of her doctors, 
She seemed to care about nothing. Slowly, her body had grown thin and weak, and often, for a short period, she would fall into a sleep like that of the dead. So far, she had not been forced to stay in bed, but by the evening of the day I arrived at the house, the power of her destroyer, as her brother told me that night, was too strong for her. I learned that my one sight of her might probably be the last I would have, that the lady, at least while living, would be seen by me no more. For several days following, her name was not spoken by either Usher or myself, and during this period I was busy with efforts to lift my friend out of his sadness and gloom. We painted and read together, or listened, as if in a dream, to the wild music he played. And so, as a warmer and more loving friendship grew between us, I saw more clearly the uselessness of all attempts to bring happiness to a mind from which only darkness came, spreading upon all objects in the world its never-ending gloom. I shall always remember the hours I spent with the master of the House of Usher, yet I would fail in any attempt to give an idea of the true character of things we did together. It was this strange light over everything. The paintings which he made made me tremble, though I know not why. To tell of them is beyond the power of written words. If ever a man painted an idea, that man was Roderick Usher. For me, at least, there came out of his pictures a sense of fear and wonder. One of these pictures may be told, although weakly, in words. It showed the inside of the room where the dead might be placed, with low walls, white and plain. It seemed to be very deep under the earth. There was no door, no window, and no light, or fire burned. Yet a river of light flowed through it, filling it with a horrible, ghastly brightness. I have spoken of that sickly condition of the senses, which made most music painful for Usher to hear. The notes he would listen to with pleasure were very few. It was this fact, perhaps, that made the music he played so different from most music. But the wild beauty of his music could not be explained. The words of one of his songs called The Haunted Palace, I have easily remembered. In it I thought I saw, and for the first time, that Usher knew very well that his mind was weakening. This song told of a great house where a king lived, a palace, in a green valley where all was light and color and beauty, and the air was sweet. In the palace there were two bright windows, through which people in that happy valley could hear music and see smiling ghosts, spirits moving around the king. The palace door was of the richest materials, in red and white. Through it came other spirits, whose only duty was to sing in their beautiful voices about how wise their king was. But a dark change came. The song continued, and now those who enter the valley see through the windows in a red light, shapes that move to broken music, while through the door, now colorless, a ghastly river of ghosts, laughing but no longer smiling, rushes out forever. Our talk of the song led to another strange idea in Usher's mind. He believed that plants could feel and think, and not only plants, but rocks and water as well. He believed that the gray stones of his house and the small plants growing on the stones and the decaying trees had a power over him that made him what he was. Our books, the books which for years had fed the sick man's mind, were, as might be supposed, of the same wild character. Some of these books Usher sat and studied for hours. His chief delight was found in reading one very old book, written for some forgotten church, telling of the watch over the dead. At last, one evening he told me that the Lady Madeline was alive no more. He said that he was going to keep her body for a time in one of the many vaults inside the walls of the building. The worldly reason for this he gave was one which I felt I had to agree. He had decided to do this because of the nature of her illness, because of the strange interest and questions of her doctors, and because of the great distance to the graveyard where members of his family were placed in the earth. 
We, too, carried her body to its resting place. The vault in which we placed it was small and dark, and in ages past it must have seen strange and bloody scenes. It lay deep below that part of the building where I myself slept. The thick door was of iron, and because of its great weight made a loud, hard sound when it was opened and closed. As we placed the Lady Madeline in this room of horror, I saw for the first time the great likeness between brother and sister, and Usher had told me they were twins. They had been born on the same day. For that reason the understanding between them had always been great, and the tie that held them together very strong. We looked down at the dead face one last time, and I was filled with wonder. As she lay there, the Lady Madeline looked not dead but asleep, still soft and warm though to the touch cold as the stones around us. The Fall of the House of Usher, Part 3 I was visiting an old friend of mine, Roderick Usher, in his old stone, his palace, where a feeling of death hung in the air. I saw how fear was pressing on his heart and mind. Now his only sister, the Lady Madeline, had died and we had put her body in its resting place, in a room inside the cold walls of the palace. A damp, dark vault, a fearful place. As we looked down upon her face, I saw that there was a strong likeness between the two. Indeed, said Usher, we were born on the same day, and the tie between us has always been strong. We did not long look down on her, for fear and wonder filled our hearts. There was still a little color in her face, and there seemed to be a smile on her lips. We closed the heavy iron door and returned to the rooms above, which were hardly less gloomy than the vault. And now a change came into the sickness of my friend's mind. He went from room to room with a hurried step. His face was, if possible, whiter and more ghastly than before, and the light in his eyes, gone. The trembling in his voice seemed to show the greatest fear. At times he sat looking at nothing for hours, as if listening to some sound I could not hear. I felt his condition slowly but certainly gaining power over me i felt that his wild ideas were becoming fixed in my own mind as i was going to bed late in the night on the seventh or eighth day after we placed the lady madeline within the vault i experienced the full power of such feelings sleep did not come while the hours passed my mind fraught against the nervousness I tried to believe that much, if not all, of what I felt was due to the gloomy room, to the dark wall covering, which in a rising wind moved on the walls, but my efforts were useless. A trembling I could not stop filled my body, and fear without reason caught my heart. I sat up, looking into the darkness of my room, listening, I do not know why, to a certain low sounds which came when the storm was quiet. A feeling of horror lay upon me like a heavy weight. I put on my clothes and began walking nervously around the room. I had been walking for a very short time when I heard a light step coming toward my door. I knew it was Usher. In a moment I saw him at my door, as usual very white, but there was a wild laugh in his eyes. Even so, I was glad to have his company. And have you not seen it, he said. He hurried to one of the windows and opened it up to the storm. The force of the entering wind nearly lifted us off our feet. It was indeed a stormy but beautiful night and wildly strange. The heavy, low-hanging clouds seemed to press down upon the house, flew in all directions against each other, always returning and never passing away in the distance. With their great thickness, they cut off all light from the moon and stars, but we could see them because they were lighted from below by the air itself, which we could see rising from the dark lake and from the stones of the house itself. "'You must not! You shall not look out at this!' I said to Usher, as I led him from the window to a seat. "'This appearance, which surprises you so, has been seen in other places, too. Perhaps the lake is the cause. Let us close the window. The air is cold. Here is one of the stories you like best. I will read, and you shall listen, and thus we will live through this fearful night together.' The old book which I had picked up was one written by a fool for fools to read, and was not, in truth, one that Usher liked. It was, however, the only one within easy reach. 
He seemed to listen quietly. Then I came to the part of a story in which a man, a strong man full of wine, begins to break down a door, and the sound of that dry wood as it breaks can be heard throughout all the forest around him. Here I stopped, for it seemed to me that there was some very distant part of the house sounds came to my ears like those of which I had been reading. And it must have been this likeness that made me notice them, for the sounds themselves, with the storm still increasing, were nothing to stop or interest me. I continued the story, and read how the man, now entering through the broken door, discovers a strange and terrible animal of the kind so often found in these old stories. He strikes it, and it falls, and such a cry that he has to close his ears with his hands. Here again I stopped. There could be no doubt. This time I did hear a distant sound, very much like the cry of an animal in the story. I tried to control myself so that my friend would see nothing of what I felt. I was not certain that he had heard the sound, although he had clearly changed in some way. He had slowly moved his chair so that I could not see him well. I did see that his lips were moving as if he were speaking to himself. His head had dropped forward, but I knew he was not asleep, for his eyes were open, and he was moving his body from side to side. I began reading again, and quickly came to the part of the story where a heavy piece of iron falls on a stone floor with a ringing sound. These words had just passed my lips when I heard clearly, but from far away, a loud ringing sound, as if something of iron had indeed fallen heavily upon a stone floor, or as if an iron door had closed. I lost control of myself completely. I jumped up from the chair. Usher still sat, moving a little from side to side. His eyes were turned to the floor. I rushed to his chair. As I placed my hand on his shoulder, I felt that his whole body was trembling. A sickly smile touched his lips. He spoke in a low, quick, and nervous voice, as if he did not know I was there. Yes, he said, I heard it. Many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, but I dared not speak. We have put her living in the vault. Did I not say that my senses were too strong? I heard her first movements many days ago, yet I dared not to speak. And now that story, but the sounds were hers. Oh, where shall I run? She is coming, coming to ask why I put her there too soon. I hear her footsteps on the stairs. I hear the heavy beating of her heart. Here he jumped up and cried as if he were giving up his soul. I tell you, she now stands at the door. The great door to which he was pointing now slowly opened. It was the work of the rushing wind, perhaps, but... No. Outside the door... A shape did stand, a tall figure in its grave clothes, of the Lady Madeline of Usher. There was blood upon her white dress, and the signs of her terrible efforts to escape her on every part of her thin form. For a moment she remained trembling at the door, and with a low cry she fell heavily in upon her brother. In her pain, as she died at last, she carried him down with her, down to the floor. He too was dead killed by his own fear. I rushed from the room. I rushed from the house. I ran. The storm was around me in all its strength as I crossed the bridge. Suddenly, a white light moved across the ground at my feet, and I turned to see where it could have come from, for only the great house in its darkness was behind me. The light was that of the full moon, of a blood-red moon, which was now shining through the break in the front wall. That crack, which I had thought I had seen when I first saw the palace. Then only a little crack. It now widened as I watched. A strong wind came rushing over me. The whole face of the moon appeared. I saw the great walls falling apart. There was a long and stormy shouting sound, and the deep black lake closed darkly over all that remained of the house of Usher.
Thank you once again for joining us today at the Patuxent General. Happy Halloween, and we can't wait to see you next time. So if you have a question or a ghost story, or just want to reach out for an order, our email is jess at patuxentgeneral.com. But until then, I'll meet you right back here next time at the Patuxent General. A Something for Posterity production, pre-recorded in Patuxent.